Hello ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another episode of Mailbag where we answer your questions to help you build a team this 2023 preseason. My name is Damo and joining me as he usually does is Clarky. How are you my friend? To quote the fabulous Taylor Swift, it's me, hi, I'm the problem, it's me. Speaking of Taylor Swift, this week's guest is the lovable Patch. Patch, thanks for being here. Hello, thank you for letting me come back after ruin just pointless, useless, painful questions each and every week that I throw at you. You still have brought me on, which I can only assume is because you ran out of guests and all of the good guests had gone, which there have been a lot of really good guests this year, so well done to you guys. Um, hello, thank you for having me. Yeah, we've had MJ from the Coaches Panel, we've had Ben from Supercoach Insider, we've also had Leg Dog. We've also had, had DR Al. from Supercoach with DR. He does yep. great YouTube videos. And if you haven't listened to our previous episodes, they might actually still be relevant now. So you can go back and listen to them as believe, you as you want to. I can't believe you'd forget Al Payton like that. Doing the man dirty. Yes, the wonderful official Al Payton of the official KFC Supercoach team. And look, there's plenty more coming. We've got we've got a secret list, of secret Oof. guests that you only find out the week before the episode. So, guess coming out the wazoo. We keep asking, keep those questions rolling because people want to come on because you ask good questions and because we're handsome. And Patch, I need to ask. Hello. How deeply entrenched is Mason Redmond into your side? Yes. <laughs> I've good. committed the bit now. Like if I don't start him, then I'm I'm letting everyone down. Really. Like well, I, I, I want Elliot Yo at D two. I don't want a primo at D like at D two. I want Elliot Yo there, and I, I don't have the gumption to put Mason Red at, Redmond at D one. So it's, I've changed my structure just because I committed to Mason Redmond about halfway through last year. And if that doesn't sum me up as a fantasy football player, I don't know what does. Well, as we as we record, uh, the St Kilda and Essendon are head to head at the moment. Um, in a preseason game yesterday, Port Adelaide, Fremantle, Brisbane, Geelong, and Collingwood, Hawthorne all played. What did you guys take out of those games? The thing that got me was Nick Dacos got tagged and couldn't handle it. So is he really worth it at 500k? I think that was kind of 50-50 on that for me because, yes, it's... This one is slightly higher stakes than the match simulation, but also, you know, Hawthorne were playing, I think, what, two or three taggers as points during that game there. Two. Yeah, it was um, Finn McGuinness and somebody else on Jordan Degoe, um and Nick Dacos. So I don't see Dacos being a number one tag target for a lot of teams during the year. Like, as, the, as a Melbourne fan, I don't see us committing more than one tag to any team. Um, like it's, yes, it is a concern that he couldn't handle the attention, um, but also the stakes aren't really there. Like if he gets tagged, he just goes, oh, okay, well, I'm just going to cruise through this and just do the best that I can and whatever. I, I've i been looking for a reason not to pick him for all of preseason because everyone's picking him and me picking him would be boring and also because I can't pick him and Mason Redmond and as previously discussed, I'm legally obligated to select Mason Redmond. Um, so I was delighted to see him get tagged and to, to not cope with it because then I can feel less guilty about not starting him and then push the regret and the, the realisation that I've made a terrible, terrible mistake down the road for another three or four weeks. Um, so it's excellent news for me. Finn McGuinness being their number one tagger would indicate that I would think that Dacos would be their number one target. And I think for like a like Dugowie is hard to tag in the same sense that you probably wouldn't tag a Jake Stringer type or a Cam Zerha when they're in the middle because he kind of was starting there and then pushing forward. And Tom Mitchell, likewise, as Collingwood has been very happy to, to shout from the rooftops for years and years, you can't tag Tom Mitchell um, and I don't know who else in the midfield you'd be tagging from them. Um, you know, I, I would think that Dacos would be towards the top of that list um, of players you would tag. He's not obviously not going to get it every week, um, maybe not every tag, but it, it's certainly something that uh, a nice reality check for people that were set on him um, just to, to give that, that little bit of warning ahead of time. 
I think I'd like to, at this point, uh, issue our first uh, official apology for the year. Uh, last week with Lech Dog, we did, in fact, state that Darcy Cameron was a poo-poo. And this week, he was, in fact, not a poo-poo. Um, a new new, mate. Yeah, yeah. A, a yeah. new lease. It, um, he, was splitting, he was splitting time with Cox and the Ruck, which I think and still came out with a casual... Was it 94 thereabouts? Which is kind of what people were looking for for him. So welcome back to R2, Darcy Cameron, and I apologize. I don't think he'll be someone who will stay in people's R2 position all year long, but he's someone who you could start there and then swing forward once we know how the rucks are structuring up and how we, and who we know is going to actually perform at their price point. So he's someone who you start, then you move once you're doing your upgrades in your forward line or something along those lines. And you would think he would be in the conversation to be a top 10 forward, if not a top three or four Ruckman. So he is someone who we probably can look at starting, even if he does eventually or does to begin the year, um, share that role with Mason Cox or someone in that Collingwood side. Yeah, well, my, my plan with him, as I mentioned on the pod with Lech, is at this stage to just hold him until uh, Gold Coast have their buy and then potentially move him up to Jared Witts. Um, hopefully Witts loses some coin, uh, Cameron makes some, but I could also just swing Cameron forward if we think that's that's the way to go. Um, but yeah, as it stands, you'd, you'd think looking at the, the forwards, the, the forwards that are currently available, um, you'd think he'd be top 10 in that list and then depending on who we get swung forward from uh, the DPP additions through the year, could be top 15 or 20 by, by the year's end. And it therefore completes the circle of hype uh, around Darcy Cameron, just in time for the season to start properly. Um, I think the other thing that we can probably mention is Cam McKenzie. Cam McKenzie. That was a good game. 180k rookie. Looks like someone... Will need to fit into our teams. He he scored he he scored quite well. I don't know if that's what how he will score during the year because, as pointed out on Twitter Dan, by Dan Batten, uh, Josh Ward had a similar uh, preseason match and then averaged forty nine for the season or something along those lines. So there is so he's not going to have games like this every week, but. As Hawthorne fans are telling me, Cam McKenzie and Josh Ward are different types of players. And they're also going into different types of midfields as well. Hawthorne's midfield last year was, while they were not a good team, it still was a side that contained Tom Mitchell and Jake Romero, who are A-grade midfielders. And Hawthorne's midfield this year has has an A-grade midfielders. Um, dare I say it. It's uh, He'll get far more opportunities than Josh Ward did Last year, and I think both he and Ward will be at a lot of centre bounces, um, at least you know for the first half of the season. I I would expect more, but still that could only be a sixty or a seventy. But I, I'd feel a little bit more confident in him um, so far. And there aren't there aren't a lot of other midfield rookies around, so uh, we might just have to. He might just be a bench spot, which hurts at one hundred and eighty watt whatever k. But I don't know. I, I unless someone else bobs up, he might be what we've got. Yeah, take what you can get. I was at the Port Adelaide Fremantle game and took a couple of things out of that. Uh, Scott Lysett, don't pick him at 429k. Controversially, he's, is he's, a poo poo. He's. What'd you say, Damo? He is the new poo poo, yes. Um, well, new poo. <laughs> Sam Sturt looks like he could be a rookie option that we have a look at at 123k. He looked very good with ball in hand, was attacking the uh was it was attacking the goals as well as he could and moving up the ground every now and then and even had s- some s- stages of the game where he was starting on the wing as well so he's someone to look out for he won't get much of the ball but he's someone who if named should score okay as long as he finds um the the goals every now and then uh the other player that kind of stood out to me was Nat Fife um, even though he was stuck forward, it was basically what he would do in the midfield, just in the forward line. He was throwing himself into contested situations, ripping the ball out, and 
he and if he if he wasn't doing it himself, he would find someone who could find the goals. So I think at three hundred and thirteen k, he's going to be a good starting option despite his role change. Yeah, well, he scored ninety odd despite not attending a single centre bounce. It, it looked like. Um, so you know, obviously take the scores. You know, with whatever grain of whatever sized grain of salt you take preseason scores with, but it shows that there is still the capacity for him to get points. You know, he still kicked the three goals, but you know, he can still score in that role. Where I was very apprehensive that he'd be able to break through kind of eighty without going into the middle, but uh, no, I was wrong. And he's a player that Champion Data loves because he does the contested stuff, and that's that's cash money, baby. Does it? Does it just mean possibly that over the course of the season, his variance is just wider between his high and low? Possibly just because even though he is, you know, doing all that contested stuff at the front, if it's just not going well for you guys, and fingers crossed that it goes well for you, Damo. Um, but if it's just not going well for them, then he's, you know, going to pull out a 40 odd. He needs to average 84 to make 150k on his current price. I think he will do that quite comfortably, but and whether he is a season long keeper or not is probably another question, but I think he'll have games where he scores 90s or 100s, but then he'll have other games where he'll score 60s or 70s and it might just be one of those players where you have to time your run to to get rid of him. Um, just based on who who um, Fremantle will come up against. And their first six or seven games of the season are much easier than their next six or seven after that. So maybe after seven or eight games, that's when you just that's when you move him on and try and grab someone who's come down in price. Maybe that's when you move Darcy Cameron into your forward line and, and pick up a ruck before they run away or with themselves. Um, but yeah, I think at this point, of the preseason and we only get one preseason match to have a look at it, but he did well against Adelaide the week before as well. I think at this point of the preseason, I think Nat Fife has shown that he is going to be value at his price. So there's probably one port player that we should really talk about, but I do just want to, while we're talking Fremantle, just to ask your take on it, Damon. Will Brody quietly just had a pretty good one yesterday as well as any ideas on what we should expect from Matthew Johnson. Matt Johnson only entered the game for the final quarter. I don't think he's going to be in the conversation for the round one team, but they clearly want to get game time into him. So I would say we will see him at some point during the season. Um, Yeah, I, I think he's one that the club is really big fans of and they want to see how he matches up against AFL bodies. And I don't think this will be the last time we see him for the season. And Will Brody? And Will Brody, uh, he attend, he, he's been working on his endurance. So clearly uh, after yesterday's game where he spent more time on ground than he did basically for all of last season means he's probably going to get his hands on the ball a bit more and, um, Cham- and uh, Fantasy Pre- Freako tweeted out that he's one of the best points per minute players in the in the AFL. You can't, you can't see this, listeners, but I'm making... You know, when you type in eyes and you get that little emoji? That's what's happening to me right now. Mm, he's, he's, will, will he be top 10, though, Clarky? Like, I, I love him, and I think I, he'll be good, oh. but it's, it's yeah, it's an interesting one of, like, as much as you love looking at a... a Bloke like Will Brady getting a 130, 135, whatever it was in the practice game. You're like, oh, but will he? Well, so I, I so see the... those eyes. I'm I'm looking at you, Clarky. I, <laughs> I know I know you, and I know that you are immediately well, so... going to your team and putting him in there. No, 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 not specifically. He's not going to go straight in for me. But I think I just very distinctly remember having a conversation with Damo previously, and I might have even been on one of the mailbags where we kind of identified that one of Will Brody's take like takeaways of cons of having him was that his time on ground wasn't necessarily consistent and he didn't have that tank so you know like is that just a step where that is potential and I I think he's someone who will be on my watch list for a good portion of the year because it's just once again if you get someone on their really hot patch or um you know get them at their lowest price and then they explode out that's something it can put you ahead so I think it's more of a 
keep him on your watch list because he could be something really special. We've got one more game to discuss. That is the Brisbane and Geelong game. Actually, before we do that, Connor Rosie, pick yeah. him. He was going at oh. half pace. He picked up about 25 disposals. He just he just looked very comfortable. He attended all the center bounces. He just, just pick him in your forward line and ride him for the entire year. Um, Brisbane, Geelong also played at the same time or started a little bit afterwards, but was basically the same time as the Fremantle Port Adelaide game. And Will Ashcroft is going to be very good at football. I'd argue he already is very good at football. But in terms of super coach, we don't know that yet. Yes, I, I'm being facetious. Uh, <laughs> is he but... good at super coach? He's it good looks at football. like he scored 90 odd, and by gum, it's going to put them on the map. Um, and Josh Dunkley also looked very good as well. Lockie Neal looked very good. All of the Brisbane players that you wanted to look good looked good. Even Darcy Wilmot, despite only scoring a 50 odd, looked very comfortable on in that wing position for Brisbane. So I would say you can probably select him. Connor McKenna has been very quiet. I actually. I don't have him in my team because I think you can get value elsewhere. I think he'll be the sub a lot as well. Yeah, I think they brought him in, but he's going to be fighting for his position. Like that's, I think that's kind of how it's always looked at. And Wilmot seems to be ahead. Like he played finals last year. He's already got that sort of track history. So Brisbane are confident in what he can do. So really it's kind of his spot to lose, I guess at the moment it looks like. So I don't know, we'll, we'll see what happens, um, but I'd, I'd probably feel pretty comfortable starting Wilmot at this stage. The other thing that intrigued me most from this game was only kind of 18 hours after it finished, or 12 hours, like uh, this morning, when uh, when Foz popped up the message that Tanner Bruins apparently forward eligible, which, Ooh. what? I didn't I didn't realise that. I had not been paying attention, and at 311k, 3k cheaper than Nat Fife, I'm doing the eyes thing that Clarkie was doing a second ago. <laughs> I, can, mm-hmm. I I don't know if I can trust Chris Scott. I will he stay in, in midfield? Will Will he stay in that midfield p- p- for the entire season? I don't know if I can trust Chris Scott. I think there is as much risk in Tanner Bruin that there is in Nat Fife. So yeah. I think you only can start one, and it's whichever one you're more comfortable in starting. Most of my Geelong based information at this stage comes from. Uh, either a separate football podcast, uh, How Good's Footy. Shout out to you if you ever listen to this. Um, and also Matt Forrest. So Matt Forrest, Foz Daddy, the man himself, seems pretty confident that Tanner Bruin's best 22, which is good. And he did a reasonable breakdown to me that made sense where Tanner Bruin has space to get more midfield minutes as the season goes on. So I don't know. Like It's a mid-pricer. You know, you, you're going to pick one or two of them. Him or Nat Fife doesn't, they're not particularly worse than each other. Yeah, I, I have the, my gut says that Tanner Bruin, if he's playing center square, has a higher ceiling than Nat Fife. He's, he's a, potentially a less safe pick, um, but he's only really got to do it for eight weeks. And it looks like, based on the, the two two games we've seen, it looks like they're going to give him that crack, which we didn't really expect. I didn't expect him to be best 22 when he was traded at the end of last season, but I, here we are. What do I know about stuff and or things? So I, at this stage, I I liked what I've seen from him. Um, but again, we'll, um, we'll see how, we'll see how it goes. Well, that'll be something we'll dissect over the next week or so when we get a clearer picture as to what we're looking at in the forward line and, and the rookies really will shape up. If it's looking as, um, as kind of empty as it, it might be, then maybe we have to have a few more of these guys and less of the, the Josh Dunkleys and Connor Rosies. The other thing that's, that I just want to mention is Asava Radigalia. Uh, I don't know if he's actually a must have. Um, he looks okay. He looks comfortable in that back line, but I don't think at 174K, you're going to get what you saw from him against Hawthorne every single week. So he's one that actually left my side so I could bring in Cam McKenzie I, and I was quite comfortable making that change. And if you want a rookie ruck, we've, we're likely to get Lachlan McAndrew and probably Samson Ryan as well from Richmond who will play while Tom Lynch is out with 
plantar fasciatus, which is when all of his plants become fascists. Um, <laughs> and something's also wrong with his foot. Um, <laughs> I, I, I don't know. I, it's one to keep an eye on. He played apparently reasonably well for Richmond and is, is one to have a look at. He might maybe, I don't know, but there are some yeah. other options that are not 170 K and yeah. not a Sava Radigalia. I do, okay. I do love the Radigalia conversation that everyone's had because, and, and I was just as guilty where it's like, huh, this could be a genuine option. And then he plays in the Geelong side again and we go, oh, that's right. He plays a side <laughs> that's on. not Hawthorne and suddenly doesn't score a million points. And you're yeah, like, and oh, the, uh, yeah. this is, yeah, I, Hawthorne, I, they're not going to be good this year. Oh. Yeah. Anyway, this is the Mailbag podcast and... We should probably get to the questions that have been asked. It's been all bag and no mail. So let's get to the questions. The first one comes from Rob Wiley on Twitter. He wants to know what types of players do we expect to be the sub? Will it be a rookie? Will it be a veteran who can play multiple roles? And will it factor our decision making when choosing our starting team? For those that have heard um the podcast a few weeks ago that i did with lek dog i said that i was trying to avoid first year players because i expected them to be the sub more often than not there will be players that get a good run at it like a uh, ruben jinby like a will ashcroft um but then you get players like Mateus philippu uh even george wardlaw are probably likely to be the sub every so often as they build fitness, as they build into an AFL system. But then there will be other clubs that choose to run a veteran. Like it wouldn't surprise me if Michael Walters Achilles injury has come at just the wrong time. And now he has to work his way into the team through being the sub. I think generally my, like I would usually expect it to be someone who can play multiple roles and those roles exist anywhere from half forward to half back. Like that's my general rule for looking at players who have potential to be subs because it's not very often, I think re- really that you see like a key, it's a key position player unless they're happy with their depth on the ground. Um, the pure example being for me, Melbourne, where it's James Jordan can pretty much play anywhere from half forward to mid to wing. Um, Tom Sparrow, those guys like that. So it's it's an interesting one. And that's why Patch mentioned that Connor McKenna could be the sub because he can play at half forward or half back with stints on the wing and even through the midfield if they really were in a pinch. Yeah, I mean, it's, he's, there's, he's got explosive power and run and, you know, imagine trying to catch Connor McKenna at the start of a game, let alone after you've run out three quarters and suddenly here he is fresh as a daisy off the bench, at, you know, three quarter time. But I think part of it will also play into like different clubs will use it differently because you look at say Geelong and they can like, they've got Mark Blissards who can play literally any position on the ground from like a crumbing small forward or a back pocket to the ruck or midfield. And they can then, that means they can have anyone as their sub and then immediately just like whoever's gone down or whoever gets subbed out, but Sars can play in the ruck if they sub out, sub out Reece Stanley. He can play fullback if they sub out a, a tall down there if they can. So that means they can do whatever they want, whereas Hawthorne might then look at like a Josh Weddle who has more utility, who can then come in and play a quarter where he can also play any role. Um, so I think it will kind of vary on how much depth clubs have within their own sides as well as um, what sort of players they'll be looking at, which is kind of my way of saying, I don't know what's going on. It's confusing. It's scary. I'm going to basically not think about it too much because I think if we start playing into those hypotheticals, you're just going to tie yourself in knots. And I think there's there's some cases where you look at a, a McKenna and think, oh, gee, there's a chance he'll be the sub. Maybe I'll, I'll avoid him. And if you, you think Tanner Bruin will be a sub candidate, then obviously don't pick him. But I, I am not going to try and pick sub candidates because you know we used to when they first introduced it everyone was like oh it's going to be a second ruck and they'll come in at three quarter time and freshen up and it was never a second ruck so i i don't know i will assess it as we go through the year but i'm not basing too many starting selections off that yeah i think um as well when it comes to factoring it into your team it's what we refer to always as we're picking rookies usually who fill that void of significance. So there's usually a role. There's usually a reason of why they're going to be in the starting 22. 
sometimes that there is competition for spots. So Wilmot and McKenna are probably the best example of that this year. It's a competition for a similar spot, but sort of this is why the preseason games can be kind of important because you can see, well, how well is this person? They don't have to come out and score a million points, but they have to come out and show that they're going to be part of that team and that they've cemented their efforts for that, you know, three, three rounds at least, you know, four rounds. Yeah, and you look at most of the rookies we've got. That are, they're pretty popular in that you've got Toby McLean with a defined role, Fergus Rand with a defined role, Charlie Combin with a defined role, Osava, defined role, you know, Ruben Jimby, Elijah Hewitt, Ch- Campbell Chesser are all defined roles. They wouldn't get too much of a look in at the sub vest. Will Ashcroft sliding into a position, Josh Goder across halfback, Darcy Wilmot on the wing. They've all kind of got those roles and they're the rookies we're looking at. It's kind of the ones that will start popping up during the season, might be the, the concerns. And I think that'll be a case by case basis. Next two questions are pretty much the same, so I'll kind of roll them into one. The first one is from Jevs, and he sent us an email, and he said, with the extra trades, could it be viable to go with more mid-prices? And then Coit asked this question in the website comments where he's asked, with more trades this year, does it allow us to be more aggressive in our initial team with a safety net for patching the holes where they appear? So, like, would this be stacking up mid-prices or stacking up speculative picks um, com- compared to, to starting premiums or anything like that? I don't think the extra trades should change your mindset when starting, when putting your team together, but they do sort of provide a safety net if something doesn't pan out that you want to try. I, I agree. And I understand where you're coming from, but personally, I would look at it on the other end. Um, so, Abs Magic, um, Super Super Coach Godfather, um, Godfather, uh, which whichever one you want to know him as, lovely man. He's a voice of a community. This preseason has been absolutely nothing but positivity. He finished fourth last year, and he didn't have a trade for what the last three rounds. Or something ridiculous like that. Now, imagine if he did. So, the, the, like, the, there's two types of ways you can look at it. And it's about how you want to play it. If you want to be aggressive at the start and you are comfortable using those extras to sideways and jump around, that's how you want to play it. Absolutely. But make sure you have a plan. And make sure that that, back, like that backup plan that you're talking about, that safety net, you are confident that that is a safety net and it's not just a, oh, well, this could happen. Because the other alternative is pick your team now that you're confident with. And then if you've got extra trades at the end of the year and you're really competing in your league, in your head-to-head, in your overall, then you've got those extra trades to really kind of move premiums sideways. But on the flip side, YOLO... <laughs> like whatever like yeah also that also like be free i mean you yeah. can then also mount the the argument that that abs magic would might not have got to fourth if his lad trades left yeah yeah absolutely and that's kind of my point as well where it's there's multiple ways of looking at it and it's individual yeah I, i've been looking at it at, at the point where i was i was too far behind the eight ball last year i was six rounds behind everyone else and getting my team finished and didn't use a trade boost and this year especially the last couple of days even i've just kind of looked through and gone why don't i just try and supercharge the point generation and the the cash generation with we've got players that you know you've got your fives you've got your brooms you've got your your hoppers your sheets we'll talk about them in a, a little bit yos why not let's give it a whirl jack zebel like come on down the one thing is though Yes, the trades do give you a bit of a safety net, but you don't want to be patching holes too often. You don't want to make a team that is a complete sieve. True, but I mean, with mid-prices, you, to, to play devil's avocado again, you have more opportunity with a mid-pricer in that you can then go down to a rookie because they, they keep popping up. And then instead of going one premium to another premium, you use that chance to go mid-pricer down to a a rookie and then you're like oh hey i can upgrade earlier now um you know this mid price hasn't worked so i'm just kind of cutting them 
you know, maybe there's the argument that, you know, you, you're losing out on points from your initial team because that cash that you put into a mid-price, it could have gone into making another mid-price for a premium. But, like, that's the argument we've been having for 15 years now. And I haven't won Supercoach doing guns and rookies despite loving it. <laughs> and that means that it must be flawed. I think um, it's it's one of those questions, right, which is really interesting to hear each individual's position on it because it really does just come down to how you want to play your team like there's no there's no one best way to start your team to structure your team or to be aggressive or to not to be conservative it's it's all kind of it comes down to a real life sport that is unpredictable as much as we like to think that we can predict it um yeah i I completely I, i completely see both of your points in that i think there's a lot of things that will factor into it, like your past experience. So for me, I one of my biggest super coach sins is FOMO. I get it real bad. Like I'm so worried about missing, jumping on that player at the right time or the wrong time that I often make a misstep, which leads me to be more conservative, like which is leading me to want to be more conservative this year, which could be its own problem. Yeah, and I, I think the most important part is to, like, identify w- what sort of person you are and make, like, understand why you're making the call you're, you're making. Like, I, I'm aware as to why I want to jump on new prices and I, that gives me a direction. And, like, you know that, you know, when you're assessing a trade, you're like, oh, is this a good trade or is it just me having FOMO? Like, having that that awareness of who you are and what you're doing is is important in real life and also in imaginary football. Let's go to an easy question. <laughs> let's 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 let, let's go to an easy Very question. Good. Would you pair Rory Laird and Hayden Young or Darcy Parrish and Sam Doherty? Option number two. I wouldn't pick Parrish. I'd pick like a Steel or a Crips, but I'd, I'd rather option number two. I think Hayden Young. I think his role depends on who's in that back line. And we've seen these last two games with no Luke Ryan that he plays a different role. And I'm not saying that Luke Ryan's an injury risk, but because you're managing a back issue, but that um, he probably would have played if yesterday was round one. But the fact that they're being a bit cautious with him is some cause for concern, meaning he could miss some games throughout the season as they manage it. So I don't think that Young is going to be as safe as we thought earlier in the season. A breakout is coming, but is it this year? We we don't know. Maybe maybe it's next year. And to quote um, Abs Magic, just to calm her down, (laughs) uh, just just to calm her down, it's coming, but it might not be this year. Oh, bless you. Bless you, Abs. Um, I think the difference between those two is kind of exactly what you're talking about, where young you're kind of waiting for the breakout whereas Parrish has demonstrated history of scoring above in the same role and we know that he was injured and we know that he wasn't at 100 percent last year so Parrish and Doherty presents overall the most upside I think because Parrish we know he's coming in fit it's not going to have those niggles his core Essendon midfield who hopefully are going to be a lot better this year a lot more cohesive Ah. this year (laughs) <laughs> Patch, I'm trying to, trying to give you some positivity. Sorry, I just had something caught in my throat. Sorry, yeah. no, carry on. Yeah. Um, so I think, yeah, Parrish and Doherty makes the most sense because there's both demonstrated upside where it's this has happened before. If they get that role, then there's going to be an improvement. Whereas Hayden Young, we go, he's talented. How's that going to work though? Like is, it can work if all of these things happen, but we haven't seen it happen. Next question comes from Mini Monk. He is on the Coaches Panel podcast with MJ. I recommend going to check it out, and hopefully we will have Mini Monk on the mailbag throughout the season at some point. But he's asked, is there a world where you can pick both Jacob Hopper and Dom Sheed? And I would say yes, and I would say it's going to be a pretty popular pairing. Yeah, it's this world. This is the world. 
This is this is the one Earth C one thirty seven or whatever this one is. Yeah, I I was just thinking about it in my head about all the possibilities of having Dom Sheed in my side, and it opens up a lot of possibilities. It's it's hard to recommend more mid prices. Um, I feel no, it's like... not. <laughs> Shut up, Clarky. <laughs> For me, it feels a bit like Bart Simpson when he's running for class president. It's just more mid prices, more mid prices. <laughs> I want more. It's, but I think there's once again, it, it's demonstrated ability. Like that, everything supports that that could work. We know that it can. We've seen Jacob Hopper being successful. We know Dom Sheed is going to be in the mid more. Like this might be the year to do that. Patchy, don't look impressed. I, oh, yeah, no, I, I'm i just, yeah, I don't have anything more to add. I mean, legally, no, no. yeah, you can pick both of them. Like, morally, sure. Like, the <laughs> laws of physics allow you to select both of them. Uh, the Supercoach platform does not have a, a, a one or the other. Yes, I, for all of those reasons and the ones you've mentioned, sure, if you like both of them as selections, then pick both of them as selections. I'm, I'm not a cop. Wait, you're not a cop? Correct. <laughs> That's not Damn the it. wallet inspector. <laughs> I was trying to be an upstanding citizen around you because I thought you were a cop. No, God, no. Absolutely not. Excellent. I will involve myself in the next riot then. <laughs> now, Patch, this question Hello. might be to rally you up. I'm not sure, but it's from Pato SCCC. He wants to know, will Ridley, in his loose role, be taking the kick-ins and score more than Redman? Yeah, maybe. I don't know. I, if I was watching the game that's happening right now instead of recording, maybe I'd be able to tell you, but I, I do not know <laughs> at this point in time. Um, I don't Maybe. I think they Redman didn't get a massive amount of points from kick-outs. Uh, Essendon has been pretty good at sharing them around. It's kind of whoever's closest will take it. So I, I don't think that's the issue. I think it's not a it's not a one or the other. They can both score because they play different roles. I Yeah, maybe. I don't know. Um, it's all vibes, baby. Well, Lucy Goose. But do you think Ridley going back to the role that he had a few years ago will turn Redmond back into the player he was a few years ago at the same time? Do you think last season was because Ridley had to play a bit more of a lockdown role? Nah, but Redmond's not playing the same role he played a few years ago anyway, because a few years ago they still had Connor McKenna, they still had Nick Hind as a, a speedy option, they slowed out a Bassard for a little while. Like the He's leapfrogged a bunch of guys, and I think Redmond's that dashing halfback now, and Ridley's not a dashing halfback, he's an, he's an interceptor who occasionally has to play as a key position player. And yeah, I, I like an injury to anyone else in the side could mean that, you know, Ridley does have to play lockdown or Redmond does have to play like a, a small defender. I think the, the one that will impact Redmond more, who I'm interested in seeing will be McGrath. If McGrath is the one that kind of scoops up a few of his possessions or, or, you know, plays around with that scoring there. So that, I think that would be the threat to, to Redmond scoring. And I think Ridley scoring would be threatened by, because we don't have a lot of key position players that are, are fit and ready to go at the minute. Because Reed and Nick Cox, who's I think has been training more as a defender, are both still pretty injured. Um, you know, obviously um, Hayes from the draft we, we picked up, but he's 18, very raw. Kane Baldwin has been playing as a defender in the VFL. I think once, you know, if there's, there's any more than one or two injuries to key stonks down back, then Ridley probably has to play shut down. I don't know. I don't think we'll have an... I think at this stage, they're both going to score well. And uh, yeah, that we won't, we won't be able to predict the causes or the timing of when they won't. Did that make any sense? I felt like I rambled for about three minutes and then everyone's eyes glazed over and then my eyes glazed over so I couldn't see if your eyes unglazed or not. Was that no, no. was that coherent? That's no, fine. <laughs> Perfectly cromulent. Made perfect sense to me. I was just listening to you speak because I was amazed at how you were actually speaking some sense. For once in my goddamn <laughs> life. Oh, I hate it when mum and dad fight on the mailbag. <laughs> go to your room, Clarky. Or go to your tent. I am in my room. 
Jesse Munro. We love Jesse. He is the host of the Story Hi, Mode Gaming podcast. He he put Nick Martin into his team a month ago, and he's still there. Um, his question is, why do I do this to myself? But is <laughs> anyone Martin... who looks at Jesse's Twitter feed knows exactly why he does this to yeah, himself. Yeah, this, this is a self-answering question, I think. But 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 also, do we think Nick Martin's actually a viable option? Well, I mean, that's I the do. question that Jesse's asking. He's not. It's not the one he's written, but it's the one he's asking. Yeah, I think. I mean, I mean, last season he started the year really well and then kind of tapered off. But th- that was after he had been in the AFL system for, what, a month before he got b- yeah, before he that. played his fir- first game? A whole season, a whole preseason into it, he might be... He, 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 he might be an option. I like Nick Martin. I don't... I don't hate it. Like, there's just some of these guys that <laughs> people are just like, you just get real hot on. Like... There's something there and you really just know, like, okay, there's, there's something here and I think this could be how it all goes right. And Nick Martin, I would say, is probably in that in that bucket. Um, similarly for me, Errol Goulden has been in that bucket for my whole preseason so far. Where I'm just like, there's just there's just something there that if it all goes his way and I'm willing I'm willing to get hurt. I mean, yeah, he's Nick Martin is is going to play up on a wing. He's going to have runs through the middle of the ground. He'll kind of have play a bit of half forward, be a real link option like he was last year. I think we'll have something very similar to last year. I really like the cut of his jib, which is why it's so hard for me to cut him because he, he he's good. He'll be he's a great footballer. I love him to bits. From a super coach perspective, you're picking him. That means you're foregoing a spot that you would have a a rosy Taranto more. Zebel in and I think all of the other options will be better than Nick Martin but Nick Martin will be fun it will be an entertaining ride and I kind of envy Jesse for being on it and I would like him in all of my keeper leagues please and all of my drafts leagues but I I, no, not not for classic I just don't see a world in which he outperforms the other options at the same price and doesn't stress you out as you watch you know Jack Zebel become defense eligible and average 95 I don't, I don't know i just don't see it the one thing i do like this year is a lot more people are selecting teams of players they actually enjoy watching and not players that 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 are going to win them fifty thousand dollars although that right, would be nice. less people to win fifty thousand dollars good i mean although although that that would be nice People realized over the last couple of years that playing Supercoach, they actually didn't find enjoyment in the team they have because they didn't enjoy watching the players in their team. So if so, Tim, Tim Mitchell from the Herald Sun, he said he was purely going to go for players that he enjoyed watching in his team. He, it didn't mean he was going to completely tank and not pick a good team, but if he liked one player more than the other purely on, a, purely on vibes, then he would pick the best. <laughs> Pick the pick that player over the other one. This is the same Tim who, in the last two days, has gone Radigalia R two. If you haven't picked Rowan Marshall, start again. If you haven't picked Connor Rosie, start again. And I love the chaos of Tim. So Tim, if you're listening, we love you. We we'll love see you, you soon. Tim. Come on the mail back. But yeah, basically, Nick Martin, not a bad pick, especially if you enjoy watching him. Pick him, enjoy the ride. I don't think it'll be a bad time. <laughs> I'd like to summarize Damos in a more blunt way of love the pick, love that you have the balls, enjoy not winning 50k, Jesse. <laughs> Come find me. Yeah, he won't be a bad pick. He's not He's not going to be a good pick, though. He'll be no, I fine. Love it. He'll be fine. I love it. But I don't know, maybe, maybe Nick Martin's the number one averaging forward at the end of the year and Damo and I have to tuck into some humble pie together. Wouldn't be the Word. first time we were all wrong. I look, I've never been wrong before and don't intend to start now. So next question, speaking of being wrong. We got homework. SC oh, yeah. Ma- SC Mama on Twitter asked us pick the best player owned by less than five percent of teams in each line. I can't believe Mum gave us homework. <laughs> this is my podcast. This is our podcast. <laughs> Hey, she the can podcast. come back on the podcast as well if she wants to. This is an open invitation. Oh, she I mean, knows. The podcast in, is in and of itself homework. But anyway, yeah, go fair. off, Kings. 
So we'll start in defense. Um, Clarky, who did you have as your best defense players under 5% owned? So I think the obvious answer for me looking at that list was Jordan Ridley because of the upside. And we just spoke before about the upside and between him and Redmond. Um, but my more interesting pick was uh, Nick Haynes. Uh, GWS because they seem to there, there's just been a few little comments from the GWS camp that make me think he's gonna he's gonna come back because it wasn't too long ago that he was kind of eyeing off that like top ten defender areas so you know it's got it's got vibes well I mean it sounds like he's going to play the Harry Himmelberg role from the end of last season. Yeah, just not as not to an all Australian level. <laughs> uh, hey, I don't know. Maybe he will. You don't know the future. True, Ma- but I mean, look, it's not likely. But anyway, I just thought I mean, I'd, I mean, I comparatively to their me. comments about Harry being, if he played halfback, you could be all Australian. So enjoy being a forward. I look, GWS would never stuff up someone's career by playing them out of position for a, an extended period of time, Clark. You don't know what you're talking about. Don't it's true. It's get that never slander out of your mouth, young man. Yeah. Patch, who did you have in defense under 5% owned? I really like Adam Saad, which I know Lake Dog's spoken about him a fair bit. I think he'd be a, a fun option. Um, I won't pick him because there are other options that as kind of ahead and I'm, I'm going pretty cheap down back anyway. Uh, but he's someone that looks really fun, looks really exciting. looks like he'll be consistent. He's, you know, might not average 115, but he, he'll average in 95 and, you know, have stints where he does really well. Um, so he's just kind of a fun option who I think will be good and is will outperform his price point. Um, the one who I un- absolutely under no circumstances will select, but kind of want somebody else to, and, and then I can take credit for it, or I'll pick him in a draft league, is Jeremy Howe. Oh, yeah. Because... I don't know. I think the fact they've got Billy Frampton or Will Kelly to play fullback this year means that Darcy Moore and Jeremy Howe can like not play lockdown roles out of the goal square. And listening to the Keeper League pod, um, Checkers was talking about this. That you know, watching their pracky game last week, they just they did a lot of switching of the ball, and that means lots of mark kicks um, or kick marks or whatever you want to however you want to phrase it. That Howe and Moore will rack up, and I think there'll be more points there. And this has been a purely vibes-based recommendation, so take it at your own risk. But I don't know. I think he's kind of... I just think he's neat at 463k. The other pro of choosing Adam Sider is getting to go woof every time he kicks the ball. Exactly. Damo, who have you got? I've got Jake Lloyd and Isaac Cummings, so I've chosen a player from each of the Sydney teams. I think Jake Lloyd isn't too far away from returning to the player we all once loved and wanted to cram into our starting side. Seagull. I hated I've... him because he was always too expensive. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, how do I fit this man in? I can't not start him, but he's 650k. Careful what you K. wish for, Patch. Nah. It's your fault. Well, now he's the perfect price for you, Patch. Yay. <laughs> and and I think Isaac coming with um, Nick Haynes returning to his defense role with a couple of players leaving that club and, Adam Kingsley now in charge. I think he's going to play pretty much like a Sam Doherty sort of Aiden Young sort of role. And I think he's going to be one of those players that we talk about next season as players you have to have in your side and play even later in the season. He'll be people, he'll be a player that people try and upgrade to because he's having such a good season. I'm getting yeah. real like Jaden Short vibes from him and Kingsley obviously coming from the Richmond school of, of ri- the Richmond school um, where, you know, he's done his apprenticeship there and now he's graduated and, and GWS, I think will take on a bit of that Richmond mold. I uh, big Jaden Short vibes. That's, that's it. That's a long way of me explaining that. I think he'll be Jaden Short. I think he'll yeah. be good. I like him. Coming is um, probably, so, he's pretty much going to be on my watch list all year because I think there's something that he, he does have that little bit of an element that I'm like, hmm, there's something there. I'm just worried. I just don't want to go prematurely on him. I think that's my, my big go concern. prematurely on coming. All right, midfield. Patch, who have you got in your midfield? Who is your best midfield picks under 5% owned? 
Um, Finn Callahan because he's cheap and mid-priced, and I've just spoken about how fun mid-prices are, and I think you'll get a pretty decent run at it. Speaking of getting a decent run in the GWS midfield, Josh Kelly is Yay. very good at football, and if he stays on the park by gum, he'll be an a absolute bargain. Um, and also, who I probably won't pick, but George Hewitt was apparently like 11th overall for points last year in the midfield, which I didn't expect that. I think there's every reason he'll he'll do that again. I, I won't pick him, but I, I don't know. I'm interested. I'm just kind of like, oh, if he's cheap at the right time of the year, then I'm doing the eyes thing again just for people that are listening to this podcast on an audio yeah. medium and not watching us, um, which you can't physically do. I'm just doing the eyes thing again. Unless edited out, all pauses are now eye emojis for the mailbag going forward. <laughs> um, but I also had Josh Kelly is my... My my little pick is that the man's a Ferrari. Like the, it's just he's really good at football, and then a man who is about to lose his job stuck him in the forward pocket. Uh, and as I say every year at this time, I'm ready to be hurt again. And you, you know what, Clarky, that man did lose his job, and yeah. rightfully so. Good. <laughs> I'm, I'm glad. glad. You know, I'm glad Leon Cameron lost his job. <laughs> I've gone for Noah Anderson. I think he's a real um, strong chance to break out this season at, at the Suns. I think natural progression, a bit of um, a, a more defined role will pro- will help him average a little more than he did last season. And and I know Rain Man over at the SC Playbook is really hot on him and has him in his starting side. The other player I've got is Patrick Dangerfield. I think captaincy will suit him well, and I think he's every chance to be a valuable pick at his price. I think he could, Dangerfield could end up being like very Bont like not in terms of like raw football potential, but just like a big moments guy. You know what I mean? Like he's just going to come out and he's going to score like a 150. And all he did was look at the ball as it sailed through this and they win by five points or something. Like, yeah, but that'll just be get punctured. those vibes. I, I feel that that'll be punctured by weeks of like seventies which will be lots of weeks of 70s, and then, oh, it's a 150, and suddenly you get to the end of the year and he's averaged 95, but it's like from three weeks of yeah. 150s and the rest has just been 70s. So I, and yeah, old I man know. injuries like hips and joints. and uh, All of his muscles are just going to just all snap at the same point. Nah, go well. Go well, man. <laughs> oh, we love him. The best ruck for me under 5% owned is Toby Nankervis. He, he was a top three ruck last season for total points. How? In what and, world did that happen? <laughs> and I see no reason why it can't happen again, especially with Taranto, Hopper, Prestia, Graham. Who else is going to be at his feet? Bolton, Martin, all of those players at his feet. I see no reason why he can't do it again. I, but he didn't do it the first time. I didn't witness it. It never <laughs> happened. I, ref- I just, I can't. <laughs> believe he was third overall when did who let this occur toby nankervis let it he, occur he was third overall and that's upsetting that's when are you gonna start him at one point clarky last year maybe i think i i think i suggested it in an article because i was gonna start him at one point this year no the brief of my article was pod players who are under a certain percentage owned and weirdly enough here we are again <laughs> Time is just a circle, folks. Don't listen to it. <laughs> Everything is happening all at once, continuously, forever. Um, I My response to the under 5% ruck conversation was, please, God, no. Um, but I don't know. I guess Riley O'Brien? Why not? He wants his job. Like, he, he really wants his job, and he's very in danger of losing his job. <laughs> Even after the comments from Matthew Nix this morning, I still think that Raleigh O'Brien is potentially one of the safest ruck picks. He won't be one that scores you 130 and then 120 and then 130 and then 110, but he'll be one that gives you about 100 every single week. And at this point, that's pr- pretty much what you want from your R2 because you know you don't know if you're going to get that from anyone else. Yeah, big, exactly. Why not? Big Will Minson vibes. Just... Just big like, oh, he's gonna he's gonna average ninety five. He's not gonna be a Dean Cox, sure, but like who is? Um he'll be fine. He'll be he, fine. He's the he's the dumbest, smartest ruckman. 
Yeah, he's, the, he's, he's not a Toyota Camry, but he is a Hyundai XL. I just think he's, it's, this is the largest automobile I could afford. Um, yeah, please God, no. Can we move to the forwards? <laughs> Patch, who did you select as your Ruckman? Uh, Mark Blitzarves is the one I'm really interested in because he's not a Ruckman, so I'm technically not... I'm not so breaking like, yeah, the rules, I'm... says man, clearly breaking the rules. <laughs> Shut up, Clarky. Um, yeah, I don't think I'll pick him because I think he's just too versatile and might have weak three plays full back and might. I, yeah, I don't know. I, I'm interested in him, but I don't think I can do it to myself. And I also have Samson Ryan listed, but I've spoken about him already. So we'll move right along. In the forward line, I said Jeremy Cameron and Dylan Moore. Patch was shocked that Dylan Moore was under 5% owned when I selected that. And I think after seeing Dylan Moore score 70 points from 40% time on ground yesterday, he is someone who you could definitely select in your forward line and be comfortable with him over someone like a Taranto or even Canilio. I wouldn't select him over Connor Rosie though. No, I, I am slightly concerned that Moore will drop the occasional 60 or 70 because by virtue of being a forward in a Hawthorne side that's not going to be very good at football this year, um, he will just have weeks where he doesn't really touch it as much. But we look at that last month where he was really injected into the midfield properly and he was 103, 89, 102, 106. I think there that's about where he's going to be um, and he'll be a really good pick and we're not going to see him at 520k for all that long. So, I don't know. There's there's every chance we get him cheap during the year, though. So, I don't know. I, I just really like Dylan Moore. I just, I love him. Yeah, I think Dylan Moore is going to be a good pick if you start him or if you upgrade to him, whatever um, means you get to him. Clarky, who is your 5% owned forwards? Uh, look, I spoke about Earl Goulden before. Um, he's still under 5%. He had a pretty good showing in the match, Sim. I'm hoping he's going to have a good showing at the... I hope, Actually, you know, I hope he has a little bit of a quiet one, but just a good quiet one uh, at the practice game, at the proper preseason games this weekend. But um, I've already spoken about him before, so I'm going to say Cozzy Pickett because Jack, yes. Viney, Jack Viney might be injured and he might not make it to round one and Cozzy Pickett wants to play mid-time and... Jesus, that boy loves a tackle. I love watching Cozzy Pickett tackle, just like I like watching Jack Viney tackle, which means they're like for like, and I fail to see how I'm wrong. It's all happening. Like, he got 40% CBAs in the practice game that didn't have any official stats recorded and doesn't really matter or mean anything, but that's enough. Yeah, he's good. He's good. He's fast. He really loves handling the ball as well. So, I don't, if he gets the mid time, why not? Patch, you go now. Um, the one I really wanted to keep an eye on was pulled out of the game that's happening right as we record, the Essendon St Kilda game, um, for personal reasons, and there was no elaboration, so hopefully everything's okay for Bradley Hill. Yeah. Um, but sadly, it means I won't pick him, because if I can't see what he's doing and what role they've got him slated for, then I, I'm not going to throw myself at a, at a $418,400 defender forward for no apparent reason when there are lots of other players around that price range either up or down, that uh, the, the jiggle my jammies a bit better. So, I don't know. Maybe I'll keep an eye on him during the season. And, you know, if he's running off the halfback and, and averaging 100, could be a good corrective trade. But, yeah, I don't know. He was the one that jumped out when I was doing the homework. Uh, he's going to have today. a good season. He's, he's going to have a good season, I think. I'm with you on that. And I really liked that you said Brad Hill because one thing I noticed watching the St. Hill and Melbourne game last week was they looked at him at every opportunity to run the ball for them. So he's clearly going to be an outlet player that gets his hands on the ball and runs it and runs it into the forward line a lot when they have the opportunities. And Ross Lyon was a huge fan of Brad Hill when they were both at Fremantle. And I think he's going to make him one of his go-to guys at St. Kilda again this season and perhaps moving forward. So I can, so I think Bradley Hill is going to be one of those players that's going to sneak under the radar like Dylan Moore did last season and possibly be a good forward option for people to upgrade to or sideways to or whatever. Yeah. Especially as a forward, if he was just a defender, then I probably wouldn't be looking twice at him, but I don't know. I just, just really interested as to what could happen there. And there's every chance he averages 95 um, makes it a lot harder to pick him now that he's missed this this official practice game, though. 
I'm glad that that sentence as well, just when you were saying, oh, I'm glad you said Bradley Hill, because I thought that sentence was going to end with a, because like, you know, I expected you to say Stephen Hill and Stephen Hill retired um, <laughs> because I always mix up the names of everyone and actually had to Google Jaden Short's name because I nearly called him Darcy Short um, earlier. So he's a cricketer patch. Yeah, yeah, it's not the it wouldn't be the first time I've mixed up a cricketer and a footballer while talking yes. about the coach. My, fa- my favorite Hodge. Geelong backman, John Stewart. <laughs> I yeah, yeah. <laughs> Were there any more questions? Surely we've got other questions. Um, <laughs> no, Patch, really... that's, that was all the questions for today. Thanks for joining in on the mailbag. Thank you for having me on the mailbag. I've had a splendid time and I enjoy talking to you wonderful, beautiful human beings. My favorite and... episodes are patch episodes because they're always so chaotic. And I don't know how because we're all very sensible off camera. <laughs> <laughs> so, and sorry. Clarky, thank you once again. It's always a pleasure. <laughs> The winner of this year's Jock Reynolds group will take home a custom championship ring courtesy of Supercoach Champion. That's at SC Rings underscore on Twitter. Join using the code 990360. And if you'd like to pick up a ring for your league, head to supercoachchampion.com. That code again, up. Damo? That code again? 990360. And once again, for those at the back. 990360. <laughs> That's the group code. Okay, Patch, you got it now? Yes. That pause was the eyes emoji. Okay. Very very good. <laughs> if you have a question you'd like answered, all you have to do is tag your question with Jock Mailbag on social media or send an email to jockmailbag at gmail.com. We'll talk next time. See you later, community.